All right, so um, as I mentioned, uh, there's probably more questions than we have time. Uh, so if you have not yet uh, lobbied for likes, now would be time. Um, but, uh, before uh, like uh, resuming uh, the, the next part, uh, I would like first uh, like to say that I really appreciate the very high quality questions uh, that we have uh, on Slido, especially around privacy and personal data. Uh, I've been giving this kind of Slido-like lectures for the past six years now, right? Uh, ever since there's an English class in this format, uh, I've been giving this. Uh, and this really is the first time that we see such a focus on personal data protection, on privacy, on cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, maybe the the news, right, uh, around S-Lead, around Iran, and so on, uh, did uh, increase people's general awareness. But I also think uh, it is because of the heightened expectations that we have in our own work. And this makes, makes me uh, really glad. So um, thank you for focusing your energy uh, on this very important issue. So uh, let's continue. So uh, the question goes, um, so recently, uh, there are many uh, consumer-related personal data breaches uh, and of course, now we are seeing an unprecedented awareness, as I just mentioned, uh, in consumers about the right to privacy. But on the other hand, though, uh, in the digital world, it is not possible to restrict uh, our activities uh, or our consumption uh, to just uh, to merchants within the same jurisdiction. So how do we make sure that the cross-border um, privacy data standards are um, recognized and to uh, reduce the risk of such privacy breaches? And how do we make sure that other people's uh, personal data are well protected? This is an excellent question. So as, as I mentioned, uh, we've been working on the privacy preserving technologies so that you can process services without necessarily storing any aggregated personal data as pub uh, public sector work. We've been working with telecom companies and many other companies on exactly the same kind of technology except it's for the private sector. Uh, as part of our administration for digital industries, uh, we have this T cloud or Yun Shizi, and part of the Yun Shizi is to make sure that the newer uh, solutions with better cybersecurity and personal data protection uh, capabilities can uh, save on their business development costs and reach to tens of thousands of uh, mismes of micro and small and medium enterprises, uh, and now also to groups like co-ops. Uh, and um, social innovators, social entrepreneurs, uh, people focusing on long-term health care. So even though they're not registered as a company, but rather as a group or as an association or as a foundation, now the T-Cloud is also good for them uh, to use such solutions. And we still offer the same uh, 30,000 uh, NT dollars uh, subsidy. Now, uh, with the T-Cloud, we are seeing one of the very common cases uh, for privacy breaches is that it's not the e-commerce site itself, but rather when it wants to ship something to you. It has to work uh, with a shipment uh, partner. N none of the mismates can afford to have their own Lala Move uh, or Uber Direct uh, fleet. So they will have to send your address, your name, uh, your uh, mobile phone number, and other personal data to the shipment company. And the shipment company will have then to send it to the individual persons uh, that runs the shipment. Uh, and for these people, although they're, I think, now part-time employees or employees of the companies, uh, there's um, like almost zero uh, personal data protection or antivirus software or whatever installing on these uh, individual riders' phones and so on. So uh, there are many touch points here that can result in uh, personal data breaches. And once a breach happens, which is entirely automatic now, so even before you receive uh, the shipment, you will receive scam calls <laughs> that knows everything <laughs> about you, about um, the good or service that you just purchased. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, it goes uh, on the news sometimes. right? So uh, it's important then to stop the uh, downstreams from getting the personal data details this is exactly the same shape as I mentioned. The household uh, registration records is in a class A, highly cyber secure. But once it flows downward to class B, class C, class D, the risk increases 
So the e-commerce vendors uh, always say that we have uh, invested so much in cybersecurity, but we need to introduce technology so that they can hide such personal data to the people doing the shipment. Now you might ask, but the person running the shipment need to contact me, right? If I'm not home, if uh, they want to take a photo and say, oh, I have left um, the book or the uh, package uh, in the uh, management um, or something, uh, they will have to have some way to reach me, and, and you'll be correct. But you don't need to give them the mobile phone number. Instead, the shipment company or the merchandise can use the so-called imma uh, a um, like code hiding, right? Uh, personal data masking uh, technology, so that it assigns a random code. It's just like those payment accounts, right? When you want to pay a credit card uh, bill, sometimes your bank gives you this one-time use account. You just wire to that account, and the account number disappears after you wire into it. It's a kind of randomly assigned account number made just for this transaction. So very similarly, uh, we can invent entirely new telephone numbers, maybe an extension number that is a random code, and you call into this random code to reach the customer when you are a shipment handler, or you can also call back. But this code, this extension number, disappears entirely after the shipment has already been confirmed to be made. And so even if a cyber attacker get access to this report, it means nothing because it contains uh, none of the personal mobile phone numbers on both ends. So this is just one example, but you can easily uh, extend your imagination on pretty much all the cases where personal data used to be needed, but it's no longer needed uh, because of such privacy enhancing technology or PETS. And we're quite happy uh, that the largest uh, telecom companies, there's only three now, uh, three companies uh, all agreed because of the rampant scam uh, to in implement some sort of that uh, technology both in their telecom data centers and also offering it to the MISMEs so that they can also adopt it uh, relatively easily. We've had uh, pretty good success uh, in working with um, the largest uh, e-commerce providers uh, like uh, Bokela and so on uh, to introduce such technologies and you'll see our press releases uh, from the ministry uh, in a week or two about the effectiveness of such personal data um, uh, protecting technology. So this is one of the solutions is just to use PEDS. Um, the other one, <coughs> equally importantly, uh, is to have good um, what we call um, cyber hygiene. Right. So instead of uh, using the same password for all websites, use different passwords for all websites. But then, of course, you cannot remember all these passwords anymore. Right? So you'll have to use a password manager. Uh, but then what if the password manager is hacked? So you have to manage the personal uh, like uh, password manager on your phone. Uh, but what if the phone is unlocked? Uh, right? uh, so you'll have to use a fingerprint detection or something like that, biometric. Right? So one way is, of course, Actually, yes, to use a password manager and secure it on their phone and everything use and so on. And the other way is to just not use passwords. Uh, I think personally, uh, passwords is an obsolete technology now because the short passwords that we can remember are not safe. And the safe passwords we cannot remember. <laughs> so so th there, is, uh, there is no setting in which that the passwords are both convenient and safe which means that it's time for this technology to, to retire. So, so uh, but what replaces passwords? Uh, you may have heard uh, this term called pass key. Instead of something you remember, a key is something you hold. So, um, for example, um, my phone and my laptop, they both have these private keys that I can access uh, using my fingerprint. Now, <clears throat> when I use uh, the uh, official document signing system in our ministry, every time you will have to check three things. Uh, the internet connection, the behavior, the device, and my fingerprint on the device. But the fingerprint is not sent to the ministry or to the cloud. It's the device that take care of the fingerprint verification. And then the internet connection, the edge security provider, verifies this device. Uh, by installing a what we call endpoint detection, uh, a EDR software called CrowdStrike uh, on the, the phone. And then the internet connection itself is verified uh, by a layer of zero trust. So by working with three layers, any one layer can be penetrated 
but they cannot impersonate me, and it will be detected by the other two layers. And because we intentionally work with the plurality of vendors, that's to say, we use three different vendors for three different layers. It's not all Microsoft. It's not all Google. So even if an insider, like a Google employee or Microsoft employee, want to attack us, they cannot easily compromise the other two competitors. Uh, and this is something we very intentionally do uh, as part of the Ministry of Digital Affairs. So by using strong authentication and switching to pass keys, uh, instead of passwords. We also make it much more easily for the person to authenticate that they are actually who they are. Uh, and uh, we've uh, recently ha held a meeting uh, with the Ministry of Interior, and the MOI agreed to expand the use of the Taiwan FIDO, right, the FIDO app that you can uh, easily use like a citizen digital certificate, except you don't have to hold a plastic card. The phone is now that plastic card. Uh, the Xing Nong Ziran Ping the Taiwan FIDO, they agreed to extend it uh, to uh, everyone that is under the protection of the Personal Data Protection Act, which is literally everyone. Uh, you uh, may have used the TW FIDO uh, for the vaccine certificate, for filing tax, for the uh, personnel department's internal portal. These are the uh, popular uses. But so far, there's no way for uh, the private sector, uh, except some telecoms and banks, to use this. But the plastic card, the Ziran Ren Ping Zhen, the Citizen Digital Certificate, can be used by pretty much everybody. So there is a gap between the mobile part and the plastic card part. Uh, but the MOI was generous enough to say that they are now reasonably sure about the um, capability of their servers, so that they are now ready uh, in the next months or so to adjust uh, so that everyone can start using TW FIDO. And that would change a lot of things. Um, you may have seen on the news that uh, in order to uh, start an advertisement on financial investments on Facebook and other places, now the advertiser have to prove that they are actually an uh, investing bank or something, somebody that is certified by the FSC. Um, so if they're not that kind of um, banks and so on, they cannot, uh, security traders and so on, they cannot uh, post investment advices. Uh, and so on. And this will probably massively reduce the scams uh, that impersonates people uh, to advise for investments and so on. But that creates a, a problem. Like how would Facebook authenticate that this person accurately represents someone from a uh, security trader firm or a bank? Well, the TW FIDO might just be the thing uh, because it's easy to carry as part of the film so that it doesn't disrupt uh, the advertisement processing process and so on. So I think um, I'm quite optimistic that there will be a much better uptake of the TW FIDO for zero trust uh, when it's extended to the private sector use, not just um, limited public sector use. Okay. Uh, and the next one is somewhat similar, right? So we now have a new uh, Personal Data Protection Act. And that says, uh, instead of the National Development Council uh, or the Ministry of Justice before that, uh, there will be an independent commission. Uh, and uh, what do I think uh, are the jobs for the independent commission? And what are the top priorities uh, for such personal data protection activities to make sure that there is no abuses uh, for the personal data? So um, I talked about zero trust authentication, about privacy enhancing technologies, about open algorithm, about um, privacy computing, and so on. So these are all the technical parts. Uh, but the independent commission is also Im importantly focusing on the regulatory part as well as um, the strategy part. Because it's not just us uh, that have this independent DPA. Pretty much all the jurisdictions, including California, that didn't used to have independent DPA but just a DPA, turned independent in the past few years. And part of the reason why is that there is an increasing need for cross-border recognition of the personal data protection regimes so that we can freely flow 
the non-personal data across all borders, but the personal data handling need to only flow between trusted jurisdictions. And Taiwan is currently not a trusted jurisdiction uh, from the EU uh, point of view because we do not have an independent DPA. Everything else is probably good enough for the EU, but because our DPA is not independent, uh, we're not yet adequate uh, in terms of GDPR. And so uh, I think one of the main uh, goals of the new independent commission will probably be to get GDPR adequacy. Uh, and that probably also entails CBPR and uh, all the lesser right, uh, privacy uh, protection regime because if you are compliant in the GDPR, you're probably compliant with uh, a lot of other multilateral or bilateral um, agreements. So that's probably one of their, their first jobs, is ju not just domestic, but also international. Um, and the other one, I think, is just to go back and look at the universal healthcare case uh, and um, to prepare for that. We've been working for the past year or so uh, on the uh, data altruism project for sports data. So um, if you search for, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the data altruism use of uh, sports, you will see a pilot that we have run, not with universal health care, because that's sensitive and it's constitutional court, right? Uh, but with voluntarily donated sports-related data that are still related to health, but it's less sensitive. And we rely on the participant to voluntarily participate in such a uh, zero-knowledge way to share data in a non-privacy infringing way uh, for sports. And it's, uh, of course, commissioned by the National Science and Technology Council, but we are the main implementer of this data altruism scheme. So once this kind of microcosm uh, that looks like universal health care, but it's not universal care, health care, um, proves to be privacy preserving, we fully expect to work with the independent commission uh, to be formed to look at uh, this data altruism, which is done with the EU standard, and for them to certify that this way of doing things is now up to part on EU GDPR adequacy standard, and maybe some element of it can be used for the universal service, uh, universal healthcare service case. So this is the, the main strategy uh, that I'm working on now. So if that's okay, and no follow-up questions, I'll be moving on. All right. Um, the next question. Um, when will we have a button or app that can detect hidden virus or espionage program hidden in our cell phone or a computer? Well, it is, um, uh, of course there is a button, it's the power button. If you <laughs> shut down, uh, there is no virus <laughs> or espionage. <laughs> right? um, if you disconnect to the internet, the, the app is called airplane mode, uh, then there is uh, no way for the virus or espionage to function without an internet connection. Um, but jokes aside, uh, this is uh, a very good question because it talks to the importance to, as I mentioned, the endpoint detection and response. Um, a lot of us uh, have desktop computers in our office that is part of the GCB, the uh, government configuration baseline. And we're reasonably sure that if there's a virus or espionage going on on a GCB uh, computer uh, using the GSN, the governmental service network, you will be detected very quickly. However, if you're using your own phone and installing new apps from the app store, um, like it's, it's not even part of GSN, let alone GCB, right? Many of us, uh, because in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. So even in our office, our 5G connection or 4G LTE connections is as fast as the GSN connection anyway. So many of us just work on our phone uh, using instant message systems uh, that are not designed for governmental use, but rather for private sector use. Um, and uh, I'll just say the name line, right? So I, I don't use line for my official uh, duties. But uh, during the pandemic, uh, because the CECC, like everyone used line <laughs> in the CECC, um, like I, I was added to a few line groups. Uh, fortunately, the, the pandemic was over now, so I don't have to be part of any line groups. But anyway, uh, so I, I do use line uh, to contact my family and so on, but only do so like before going to work after going home from work, and I don't use line between uh, like nine and five. 
Uh, but I, I'm sure that not many of you can say that. <laughs> so, so this is a, a real problem because then uh, Line has not yet committed uh, on what we call local resilience. So in the situations uh, like in Mazu, in the emergency re resilience um, situation, uh, we will have to uh, keep the bandwidth, a very limited bandwidth from satellites for essential communications to international audience, like the correspondents of CNN or BBC and so on, they're probably going to use these satellites to communicate to international audience. And that is the proper use of, of the international bandwidth. But uh, for domestic communication, for video conferencing between us, if we use Google Meet, for example, then the uh, communication goes from this laptop uh, or this phone to Zhanghua and then back to your phone. And so it's entirely domestic. It doesn't need to use satellite connections. Uh, but if we use LINE, then it does have to use the satellite bandwidth because they don't have any local resilience data centers. Right? So whether it's in Japan or Korea or Singapore or whatever zone they're now working with, um, the entire video handshaking will have to go through the satellite. But we don't have that much satellite bandwidth. So what will happen uh, in a situation like Mazu uh, is that the local communication will stay, uh, but anything that uses the subsea cables uh, will probably be jammed or disrupted, and the satellite connections simply don't have the same bandwidth. So um, I strongly encourage <laughs> you to uh, consider at least some locally resilient backups uh, for the situations when uh, the communication resilience is disrupted. Uh, like a large earthquake, or we don't have typhoons anymore, or a cyber attacks, or things like that. Uh, but then, uh, of course, um, we're still working uh, with the instant message providers, including Signal and so on, so that they will consider, as Amazon moves uh, to local resilience, hopefully by next year, um, these solutions will also be locally resilient and not tap into satellite bandwidth. So. Uh, I think it's important to use locally resilient apps and solutions, if only because this entire routing uh, is within our capability of detection. It's also important to uh, install at least antivirus, but hopefully endpoint detection and response software on your phone so that it's still protected somewhat, even though it's not yet part of the GCP, the government configuration baseline. Uh, we have actually, uh, demanded that uh, my colleagues, ministers in the cabinet uh, all install something like antivirus in our phones and personal devices. But currently, it's not uh, all levels of management. Uh, and we're now working on zero trust architectures, um, including Taiwan FIDO, uh, that will not be expensive. Like if you all install Taiwan FIDO, um, it's just a few more virtual machines uh, purchased by Ministry of Interior, but we do not have to pay anyone uh, through joint tender, right? So uh, I strongly encourage you to, if you already have a citizen digital certificate, to install Taiwan FIDO, uh, because in the next few months, we'll be rolling out more and more authentication and so on, based on Taiwan FIDO uh, for um, authentication. Uh, and once that is done, then the endpoint detection and response has a much better uh, defense posture and hidden virus and espionage can be much easily um, detected because currently uh, we cannot distinguish your line traffic from uh, espionage uh, traffic, right? It all looks the same. Uh, and so uh, at least for official duties, we probably will have to switch to something that has a different traffic pattern vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, just you know, video conferencing with your families. All right, uh, the next one. So um, how do we resolve the social inequalities, for example, the digital gap uh, brought by information technologies? So as I mentioned, in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. Even on the tip of Taiwan, the Jade Mountain, right, you can have sufficient bandwidth for live streaming. Uh, maybe better bandwidth because no, nobody else was there to share it. Uh, so basically, uh, we make sure that everywhere has good enough uh, mobile uh, connection. But on top of that, uh, what's equally important 
is for people who are like senior people, uh, very young people, people speaking non-Mandarin languages, and so on, to still feel uh, that they're comfortable interacting with people uh, in different places, uh, in such online places. And so the T Cloud, as I mentioned, uh, is providing those tools. But who will deliver those tools to the communities? Well, of course, the Digital Opportunity Centers, taken care of by the Ministry of Education and many other related ministries, is part of the solution. And also for long term health care, we now have community centers and helpers and so on. So next year, we will roll out specifically assistive intelligence uh, that are accessible uh, for the people uh, that helps the seniors. So help the helpers, right? So like my mom is around uh, 70 years old, uh, and she can uh, still learn like new apps and new accessibility programs and so on. Uh, but my grandma, uh, over 90 years old, it's less likely for her uh, to learn the latest apps and so on. Uh, but my mom, being my grandmother's main caretaker, uh, can learn the kind of new technologies that will make her job easier to take care of her mother. And this is a uh, actual requirement that many are now feeling. Uh, and so uh, we think that with good enough assistive technologies uh, powered by trustworthy AI by next year, uh, we can um, solve a lot of the pain points of those long-term uh, healthcare takers. And if we deliver it in an accessible enough uh, um, form factor, then I'm sure that the people who are around my mom's age, like in their 60s and uh, early 70s, uh, are still um, um, cognitively active enough uh, to learn such new solutions and that will also help them taking care of people in the 80s, in the 90s, and so on. Uh, and so I think that is also a, a good opportunity uh, window to help the helpers for long-term health care in, in charge of um, like uh, taking care of their parents. So this is another venue. And of course, um, we also work with the Ministry of Education on uh, competence-oriented uh, um, education. So recently, we rolled out this uh, one device per child uh, program, Shenshen Yong Ping Ban, in all classrooms, uh, which is just this new canvas, this new window into the opportunities of co-creation, of uh, merging different classrooms together, and so on. Uh, and so uh, we would like to work with all the um, curriculum providers, tablet providers, and so on, on ways to enhance the cybersecurity awareness, like counter scam and things like that, for the students. And once the students learn the latest and greatest um, in fact checking, in counter scam, and so on, they are then the educators for their parents and grandparents. They will go home and share such uh, new knowledge and awareness uh, to their uh, family. And so all these, I think, are equally important, and we need to invest so that we fit the technology to adapt to where the people are instead of asking people to adapt themselves to technology. So that's this question. And let's uh, move on. So uh, the uh, next question says, generative AI uh, and algorithms uh, keep evolving. How do we um, devise countermeasures for uh, the digital resilience threats posed by advanced AI? Uh, for example, somebody uses AI to crack the interplanetary file system. So in the list of short-term risks, I talk about uh, the interactive defects, scam, voice cloning, misinformation, foreign information manipulation, interference. Uh, this is, of course, the first, the nearest term of AI risk. And the next one is cybersecurity. Uh, because generative AI enable a new kind of um, computer virus or computer worms. Uh, virus and worms, uh, of course, we know are from the nature, right? <laughs> so they are parasites uh, or they coexist with a larger host system. But virus and worms are not as intelligent as the hosts. Uh, that's the normal uh, situation in the nature. Uh, but generative AI now carry the risk in that in the next three to five years, the computer virus <laughs> or the computer worm actually thinks faster and is cognitively more capable than the operators on the system. And, and this is a very different uh, security threat now. So once a Trojan horse is installed uh, in the computer networks, 
he used to require teleoperators like a Yao Kong Fancy a remote controller uh, to control the lateral movement. And because they are also human, there are certain patterns that you can detect. Uh, on the other hand, though, um, if a Trojan horse uh, is smarter than human, then the, there's no remote control. It's just like a drone, right? You just send the Trojan horse in, and you do not need any connection now. And it just figures out, based on its actual computer network, how to run social engineering, how to write emails to deceive people, and so on, all without any remote controller. So this is likely the second large-scale AI uh, risk after the disinformation and uh, information manipulation. And that does have a chance of disrupting IPFS. But I uh, see many of you uh, like a question mark on what IPFS is. So, so, so maybe let's um, talk a little bit about IPFS. Um, right. So um, IPFS stands for Interplanetary File System. And the idea uh, is quite simple, really. Um, we have a website called moda.gov.tw. It can be accessed uh, through a web browser, uh, like HTTPS, moda.gov.tw. But it can also be accessed over IPFS. So if you have a browser called Brave, um, like a Yonggan, right, a Brave browser, um, that browser, if you use that browser to connect to Moda's website, it will show that it's uh, connected through an IPFS uh, protocol. What it does it mean? It means that if you disconnect from our website, that copy in the Brave browser is still there. Because instead of just browsing the website, it took a mirror, a copy of the entire website on your browser. And then, even when the internet connection is cut, you can still browse our website uh, locally on your computer. <clears throat> but it's not just that. The next time someone on your local computer network want to connect to our website, they don't have to connect to our website anymore. They can just connect to your laptop. Uh, and then your laptop will serve the Moda website to your neighbors, your peers. So if you have used BitTorrent, this is exactly like BitTorrent. People are seeding uh, the website content so everybody else can connect. And it's uh, cryptographically um, secured so that nobody can serve a fake copy of the Moda website as long as the DNS records of Moda is still available. Uh, anyone can easily verify that this, co this copy is the right copy and not tampered with. And this makes it very uh, good for people in authoritarian regimes. Um, because once you publish on IPFS, there's virtually no way to take down from IPFS because it's mirrored in like 200,000 different computers around the world. And by pinning, that is keeping a copy on your uh, computer, you're keeping this uh, material available even when the uh, authoritarian regimes perform censorship or take down on the original copy. In a sense, every node on IPFS is the original copy. And so uh, also you provide uh, plausible deniability so that uh, the original author uh, do not have to be punished because they can say, oh, I'm just hosting a mirror, right? Uh, somebody else wrote it and so on. So it's very good for especially journalists and whistleblower uh, in authoritarian regimes. And by investing in IPFS, uh, our ministry also helps the, pre, uh, the people working on democracy uh, in authoritarian regimes. Uh, but of course, that also means the IBFS uh, becomes a target uh, for authoritarian regimes to also devise ways uh, to crack down on this network. So this threat is not uh, hypothetical. This threat is quite real. Uh, fortunately, though, IBFS is open source. So uh, once the um, attackers have access to open source models and so on, if we just ensure that the defenders also has the open source models of equal or even better capability, then it's just uh, a contest of computation power and hopefully a decentralized computation power afforded by the global Web3 community in conjunction is uh, larger than the computation power in the authoritarian regimes, especially now with semiconductor uh, trading market. But anyway, the point I'm making is that uh, in such a contest, there is no telling which one will win a battle 
but a general war uh, between different ways to configure technology, uh, something that is uh, freedom-loving and promoting freedom of association speech on one side, and something that is more like top-down, lockdown uh, control. Um, in general, I believe that people want to communicate with other people, and people don't want to be eavesdrops uh, by their companies or by the, the state and so on. And so I think there will be more raw innovation, and more raw power on the freedom-loving side, uh, and uh, our investment in the public sector to such Web3 technologies like IPFS shows uh, to all our democratic allies that we're firmly on the liberal democratic side uh, instead of the um, harmony uh, state security side. All right, um, the next one. About the AI, I like to ask, is society or the government is ready or not? And if it is not ready, then what should we do and how to develop AI and how to control it from the kind of thing? Um, so the thing with transformative technology is that we're never ready for it. Uh, it just mutates uh, like a virus. Uh, it transforms the, the people's lives and uh, because of network effect, it tends to spread uh, very, very quickly. Right? So there are technologies that are equally transformative before personal computers and internet. Uh, for example, electricity, that's also very transformative. But electricity or railroad and so on, um, they are physical in nature. So it took a, a long time, decades, centuries, for people around the world to enjoy the same electricity or railroad or other connections. But the thing with AI is that it's entirely software. It's entirely made of bits, which means that to take a copy uh, to one person and take a copy to 10,000 person uh, is exactly the same cost. Uh, there's zero marginal cost in making more copies of AI models, which distinguish AI models with other transformative technologies. So we fully expect that as long as somebody discovers some way for the open source models to perform better than GPT-4, they will probably not apply a license from their government. They will just probably publish it in GitHub or Hugging Face or any of those uh, public portals. And just like IPFS, I fully expect that all censorship uh, attempts will fail because, well, people will want access to such models. And so the question now becomes, how do we make sure that the people who publish this way uh, train the models in a way that fits our societal norms instead of destroy or disrupt the societal norms? And so a model is just a compression of the data that you feed it. Right? So it's like a highly compressed version of the public internet. And the, the most advanced models still fits on a USB disk. Uh, so the models I run here are around 30 gigabytes. Uh, even GPT-4 is just a couple hundred gigabytes. Uh, and so anyone can easily transport that on USB disk and so on, which is why I said that this is as hard to censor as those bootlegged movies that you find on BitTorrent, because it's e uh, roughly equal size. Uh, and so instead of controlling its distribution, we need to move before the training of the models and control the data, the inputs, the training, the fine-tuning, the alignment process to make sure that whatever model is trained will be more or less fit with the societal norms. And this is uh, a process called alignment. Uh, we've been working on what's called alignment assemblies to ask people in Taiwan, um, I think around July, will uh, launch as part of the idea of uh, what do you expect of generative AI? Because the other thing about generative AI that's different from other transformative technology is that it's capable of understanding our expectations. Uh, so like if you talk to a nuclear reactor, uh, like I like to tell you to be safe, the nuclear reactor wouldn't do anything, right? Uh, but if you talk uh, to a language model, uh, we'd like you to be safe, uh, to be honest, uh, to be harmless, uh, and so on, and provide good examples. It actually listens to that. Uh, and this is called the alignment process. And so once we democratize this alignment process and have the society react on the current generations of language models and we train them daily to reflect the 
um, expectations of, the, of them, we can establish a new norm that makes it much easier to conform to the societal needs instead of uh, to disrupt the societal needs. And uh, we've signed a MOU with the Collective Intelligence Project, working with OpenAI and Anthropic and GovLab and other international partners on such alignment assemblies. So democratizing AI also requires AI to be a part of our democracy, and this is the direction uh, we're taking now. So next question. Um, how do we balance between the convenience uh, of the governmental services uh, and the cybersecurity? Uh, this is interesting because um, this speaks right to the to the trilemma, uh, right? Because this is basically saying that this is a, a choice that you have to make between progress and safety. Uh, but by now you already know uh, like how I would answer it, right? It's just to find this overlap. We need to uh, innovate with uh, people's participation and ask people what are the kind of technologies that can guarantee security, but also very convenient for people to access. As I mentioned, nobody likes to memorize passwords. Uh, and if you introduce a more secure technology that require you to memorize even more passwords, that would never succeed because it goes against human nature. But if you now say, oh, instead of typing any passwords, just whenever you log in uh, to your official document system, just put your finger on the fingerprint sensor, and that's it. So it took like five seconds uh, for you to enter a password, but it's now like 0.5 seconds, half a second, for you to, to touch uh, on the fingerprint sensor. And so it's more convenient, but it's also more safe. <laughs> because it's harder to be copied and subject to social engineering and so on. So we need to participate uh, in FIDO Alliance, in W3C, in all those multi-stakeholder forums. So it's not a multilateral forum with just governments, but rather a multi-stakeholder uh, forum with the private sector and the social sector, because they probably have already figured out uh, things like pass keys and so on that are more convenient and more safe. And our job is just participate in such work to bring those new ideas into the overlap here so that we can introduce new norms that are at once more secure but also more convenient. So multi-stakeholder participation is also very important. Uh, the next one. From the Russia-Ukraine war, what we can learn to strengthen our technology utilization in government and how can we run faster uh, in this field? An excellent question. Um, and uh, I think this is not hypothetical, right? We, I, I show this satellite thing, uh, a plurality of vendors, and, and that is exactly why we're planning the three-dimensional plurality of communication systems. Um, as you know, um, there was a recent incident around the Matsu Island about two subsea cables, right? Uh, there were two subsea cables, one uh, primary, one backup, uh, and one day a fishing vessel flying the PRC flag accidentally dropped the anchor and kept moving and cut one subsea cable. And just a week or so after that, another cargo ship carrying the PRC vessel, uh, the PRC flag, accidentally dropped the anchor uh, and destroyed the other subsea cable. Um, and I'm sure such accidents will still happen in the future because the, the whereabout of such subsea cables are public information. We have to make it public information because otherwise uh, other vessels may actually accidentally <laughs> drop the anchors to destroy the subsea cables. But once we make it public, well, the accidents uh, also happen. And when that happens, we discover very quickly that uh, because the Mazu people are using line, right, for payments and so on, uh, there really was no way uh, for them to uh, go around the routing. If they were using other communication uh, devices like, I don't know, Element Matrix or just plain SMS, if they're using plain SMS, then the local telecom towers can do something like emergency roaming so that no matter where, whether they're using Taiwan Mobile or Far Eastern or CHT, uh, they can still send SMS to one another without requiring um, like international connection. 
but because nobody sends SMS anymore, everybody sends Line. So all the Line messages have to go to Japan and back, and there's no place to go to Japan and back once those two subsea cables are cut. And so it um, massively disrupted uh, people's life in Matsu. Uh, and of course, with NCC's help uh, and uh, Coast Guard uh, and also um, MODA, uh, we increased the bandwidth of spectrum for the microwave connections. So that by end of this year, we're reasonably sure even when all the subsea cables are cut, people's lives will not be so much damaged. But that showed the importance of local resilience. If people were using locally resilient communication channels like SMS, uh, there or regular phone calls even, then the domestic calls between Mazu will not need a subsea connection. But because it's not locally resistant and required line uh, traffic, uh, it was not locally resistant. And uh, we also installed a non-geostationary satellite receiver uh, via the TTC, uh, the Telecom Tech Center, uh, in one of the islands in the Mazu Islands. And it receives uh, internet connection from a mid-Earth orbit uh, satellite, the SES satellite constellation. And so over the ne next year, we'll be setting up 700 or so of such uh, satellite receivers all around Taiwan. Um, and to make sure that when the subsea cables are cut and the microwave stations, because they're not mobile, uh, they are still relatively mobile satellite uh, receivers that can talk to uh, geostationary, mid-Earth orbit, and also low-Earth orbit satellite constellations so that internet connections that are necessary for the international people to know what's going on in Taiwan can still use this three-dimensional land, sea, and air, uh, including space, um, communication systems. So this is a lesson uh, that we have learned. We are also working uh, with all the agencies now to make sure that we can switch to a different defense posture when such situations happen. Uh, we will make sure that uh, all the data centers are backed up, not just in two different places in Taiwan, because if they're both in the main island of Taiwan, when the subsea cables are cut, well, <laughs> I mean, it looks the same, right? You cannot reach it from abroad anymore. So there needs to be cloud backups that store outside of our jurisdiction. But how to ensure uh, security and privacy and secure handling of such materials? Well, the idea is that we will work with multiple storage providers, uh, maybe Microsoft and Amazon and Google and so on, but none of them have the entire piece of the puzzle. Uh, it's encrypted, scrambled, and for example, we store in five different places, different vendors, but it requires four out of five, any four out of five, to piece together uh, the information to restore the operation of our essential services. Uh, so unless the attacker controlled like four out of five global cloud providers, which is very difficult, by the way, um, then uh, we are relatively safe uh, from any uh, cybersecurity takeover, uh, which is why we're also working with all three public clouds and uh, three or more satellite systems, uh, because there's a pattern here. If we, on every layer, we work with three different vendors, it's very difficult for an attacker to attempt a sudden takeover of our communication or computation systems. All right, so that's a uh, kind of grim topic, when earthquakes. So um, let's move on to something that's more, more cheerful. Uh, the, the digitalization, uh, we often find that the paper trail is still needed. Uh, for example, when we are uh, running a procurement process, a, a bidding process, at the end of the public construction or public infrastructure project, uh, although the, the trail uh, may be electronic, uh, but the auditors, uh, the people from the uh, judicial branches and so on, uh, when they say uh, provide an original copy uh, and you give them an electronically signed copy and they're like, this is not the original copy. And you would insist, no, this is the original copy. And they're like, no, you have to print it and apply a seal or <laughs> things like that in order to make an original copy. Right? Uh, and so can the Minister of Digital Affairs to uh, the overhaul uh, the regulatory systems around this. Yes, we're, we're actually doing this. So in the uh, next month or so, uh, you will see a new version uh, of the Digital Signature Act. 
the Digital Signature Act was done like 20 years ago, uh, primarily by the, mm, the president of the National Institute of Cybersecurity now, uh, He Chen-de. Right? So when, when President He was writing that act uh, 20 years ago, it was purely voluntary. Any uh, ministry or agency can choose to accept electronic signatures or electronic documents as the original, but they can also choose uh, to flip their decision on it. They just put a public notice somewhere, uh, a official uh, document, a Han or something, that says, oh, by the way, from today on, uh, this service no longer recognizes uh, electronic copies as original documents or digital signatures, and they're entirely free to flip-flop on that. But pretty much all other jurisdictions, including Japan, Korea, and uh, pretty much all of the EU, uh, take a different approach. Once you start accepting electronic signatures and electronic original documents, you cannot go back on your decision. You cannot arbitrarily say, uh, must be paper only. If you say that, it's not effective because it will be running contrary to the law. So uh, part of our revision is to require all agencies with a sunset period in the next few years. If you still want to keep something as over-the-counter only, paper only, and so on, you will have to say so in the form of a law or a regulation. And if you don't pass the regulatory process to let everybody know, but instead just post a official letter on your website somewhere, then by the end of that sunset period, that announcement no longer have any legal um, capability to be enforced. Uh, and some may ask, does it mean that we'll have to switch to digital only? No, you can still accept face-to-face uh, -face or paper and so on, but it's just that you cannot reject uh, people presenting you the electronic document as the original and electronic signature. And once that happens at the end of that sunset process, I fully expect the default to flip because then the audit the judicial canon and so on, are also subject to the same law, the Digital Signature Act, and they will have to pass new laws to say that they require paper copies, and they're probably not going to do that. Uh, and so um, I, I think uh, when the Digital Signature Act um, is on the regulatory conversation on the pre-announcement docket for 60 days, I welcome you to input your comments uh, and how it will affect your workflow and so on, because we do want to get it passed hopefully uh, by end of this year and by early next year, uh, if absolutely necessary. And so time is up. Uh, sorry if you asked one of the questions that didn't get asked. Maybe you should have lobbied harder. And thank you for very good questions. Thank you.